afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. In Vermont, maple syrup comes first, but ice cream is a close second. And today we're going to learn about a family owned and operated ice cream company with deep roots in southern Vermont. The Wilcox family has been making ice cream since 1928. Today the business is run by Howard Wilcox and his children, Christina and Craig. Howard is a proud member of the UVM class of 1966. While he was in college, he honed his ice cream skills at UVM's Dairy Bar. We'll have more on that in a few minutes. It was a couple of years ago that the Wilcox family ran into a challenge and they turned to UVM Extension for help. How did the family business lick its ice cream problem? Keith Silva explains. Working on Sweet Street in East Arlington, Vermont, has its perks. What makes good ice cream? The formulation, the ability to freeze the product very quickly. Wilcox's premium ice cream touts itself as Vermont's original ice cream. The Wilcox family has been making and delivering ice cream in Vermont since 1928. But this family business is older than that and they've got the paperwork from the Equinox Hotel in Manchester to prove it. It is a purchase order for the hotel. They wanted broilers but had enough eggs. We've been in the business since 1889, and my great-great-grandfather started peddling as a value-added product, eggs and chickens, uh, lamb, sheep. Um, even to the point in 1892, he was trading my aunt's tuition at Burn Burton Academy for land because they had students there. Today, Wilcox's premium ice cream makes 80,000 gallons of ice cream each year. It's all made by hand and it happens very fast. Christina Wilcox is the company's chief financial officer and ice cream maker extraordinaire. I'm picking up a pint, I'm filling a pint, I'm setting it down and having another pint under the point of filling in sometimes two seconds. I have to use my peripheral vision um, to, to know that the containers are next to me and the person next to me is able to take that from me to put the lid on. Um, it requires an immense amount of teamwork. Um, everybody has to, has to flow together and know what the next person needs. Um, I, you know, my, my team is very well trained and I don't usually have to ask for anything. They know exactly what I need next. Before being made in East Arlington, Wilcox's premium ice cream was made at the family's dairy farm in Manchester. In 2001, a fire destroyed the ice cream production and distribution facilities at the farm. To keep their family business going, the Wilcoxes had to keep making ice cream, which meant miles, lots of miles. After the fire happened, my dad and I started traveling to, to other locations wherever we could rent time um, in, in a facility. Um, we brought all of our packaging, all of our raw materials. Our uh, mix was made for us to our recipe. We would um, make what we used to maybe make in a week, in a whole day. Um, there were many weeks uh, over many years that that day uh, exceeded 20 hours from start to finish. It was important for uh, our family to continue our own private label, so we traveled uh, into Massachusetts, uh, into New York, uh, into northern Vermont to uh, produce our Wilcox label. Uh, and my daughter and I and my son, we'd get up at four in the morning, leave and go make like uh, 12, 1300 gallons of ice cream, load it on the truck and come home, um, and then off offload it into our storage units that we had at that time. So for us to have this facility today, it's like going from a Model T to a Cadillac. To maintain its freshness, ice cream has to be hardened off or frozen fast. Freezing ice cream quickly and efficiently requires what's called a blast freezer. There's only one slight problem. The floor of the freezer has to stay warm, at least warm-ish. We can freeze like 12 to 1600 gallons an hour from plus 27 to minus 10 in less than 12 hours. It's like in the winter time when it goes out and it gets really cold and it gets minus 20, the frost goes down in the ground. So now we have to protect the floor in our freezers from the frost permeating it down into the, to the earth because it will heave the floor. To solve this frosty problem, Howard and Christina began working with University of Vermont Extension agricultural engineer, Chris Callahan. I got involved with Wilcox through a referral from John Ryan at the Vermont Agricultural Development Program, VADP. 
I spend a lot of my time working with farms uh, on refrigerated storage and uh, other food processors on various forms of refrigeration and basically environmental control, temperature and humidity control. Um, so there was a, a pretty clear fit when uh, first talking with Wilcox. The, the difference being this is much colder. The system Callahan designed from scratch is simple and uses something there's plenty of in a warehouse, air. We have a room that is at below freezing, and we're really dealing with conduction of heat into that room away from things that we're hoping, hoping to keep warm, like moisture in soil. Um, and so what we're doing is taking air from this uh, storage, warehouse storage space and pumping it through the floor underneath the freezer to prevent it from freezing. This unit right here is one fan that is part of the floor uh, frost prevention system. It's driven by or controlled by a thermostat. And this thermostat has a sensor that's deep, in the, deep inside the room uh, under the floor. Um, and it's sensing the temperature of the floor. And when it starts to get below, uh, say, 45 degrees Fahrenheit, we kick this fan on uh, using the thermostat. And that, what that fan does is bring this room temperature air. Maybe it's a 55 to 60 degree air and it brings it through the floor to bring that temperature back up to prevent it from freezing. It's a pretty low tech, low energy or energy efficient means of preventing the floor from freezing. Chris Callahan and UVM Extension was in, just invaluable in that process. This was what you call a design build. Um, we didn't have it all figured out before the day we started. We were figuring it out as we went along. This kind of challenge fits with the service UVM Extension is tasked to provide Vermonters. A project like this really exemplifies my um, vision of what Extension is, is all about because this is really putting research-based knowledge to use. Um, this is an ice cream company that was looking to understand how to prevent their floor from freezing. There were large-scale uh, commercial, commercially available options that for a number of reasons didn't fit for this company. The key question is what are our options and how do we understand which one is best? The Wilcox family has been making ice cream for nearly 90 years. And there have been challenges along the way, for sure. But what matters most to them is that they keep making ice cream and keep their family business going for generations to come. This summer when we were making ice cream, there was, there was five of us making ice cream and three generations. So it's really very rewarding to be able to tap, pass the torch uh, to other generations and to show them some of the things that I have learned and I'm sh I have already found there's things they have learned that they incorporate. So this is very exciting and very important to us to do this. It's perseverance that's tattooed on our foreheads. So um, it's about being a part of something that is um, much um, larger than yourself. It's about, you know, um, um, it's about continuing in um, what generations before you um, um, persevered through um, to, to make this even possible. Determination and dedication are good qualities in a family or a business. And if you're a Wilcox, you could even say they're sweet. In East Arlington, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. There's one more important note to Keith's story. Wilcox Premium Ice Cream is the exclusive supplier for UVM's newly reopened dairy bar. And the milk used to make the ice cream comes from UVM's own herd of cows at the University Farm. Stay tuned to Across the Fence. We'll have more about Wilcox Ice Cream and the dairy bar in the next few weeks. Our next segment involves a statewide program that connects school kids with farmers. Rebecca Gollin has more. There are a lot of kids at Fat Toad Farm in Brookfield. The family-owned goat dairy milks about 60 goats and turns that milk into caramel sauce. A recent field trip brought a different kind of kid to the farm. Hi. Good. Well, it's going to be an exciting day here, let me tell you. <laughs> These kids are students at Braintree Elementary School. They've come to the farm to meet some friends they've been hearing about for a while. So my name is Judith. You probably recognize my name from all the writings and all the great questions you've had. You guys know Judith about. started the year by sending us a letter telling us about Fat Toad Farm and there were some pictures and then it just caused these kids to just come up with all these questions that they had based on the information she gave us. 
The students have spent the year exchanging letters with Judith Irving, who runs Fat Toad Farm with her family. They sent back a series of questions, and so then I would send back a letter and just answer all those questions, and they would then send a letter back that had new questions. They were very interested in a lot of detail and a lot of the, I would say, working knowledge of the farm, so it was kind of fun. It was more, it was a lot more than, well, how many goats do you have? It was like, how does this actually work? The letter writing is part of the Farmer Correspondence Program which is overseen by the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont, or NOFA. The program is designed to expand local agricultural awareness by matching up farmers with classrooms in their community and establishing a pen pal relationship. We were writing letters and asking questions about how much milk they produce or how they stay warm in the winter and that kind of stuff. And then we asked one about the parasites about how do you check them for parasites. And then we asked one about their caramel. How do you make it and how much milk do you need to have make a, jar, a little jar of caramel? And then we asked one that was, do you get triplets or even quadruplets or twins often? Is that really good or is that a bad thing? So we're really trying to get farmers to talk about things that, what are you doing in the winter when we can't see you? What are, what's going on? Abby Nelson so is the that. Agricultural There's, Education Coordinator at NOFA. She says that the main purpose of the program is to establish ties between students, farmers, and the communities in which they live. If we're going to grow the farm economy, if we're going to have more people eating healthy foods, and et cetera, the most likely avenue for that is for people to value the food. And how does that happen? It happens by having a relationship either with the food, with who made the food, or who grew the food. And the more that we understand where the food comes from and the people involved in it, the more valuable the food is. Like all farmers, Irving does not have much free time. She says that connecting with the students gives her the opportunity to take a moment and reflect. So just ask questions like, do you like being a farmer? Like, whoa, I guess I should think about that before I answer it. What do I like, what don't I like? I mean, they just really want to know. And it's just been a great way to open kids' eyes up to the world of farming. Zinnia had a baby this morning. I the class couldn't make it to the farm during kidding season, so Irving sent them some videos of the goats giving birth. That's just one example of how the students learned a lot about what's going on at the farm. Thanks to the miracles of iPhones, you know, we took a lot of videos of goats actually having kids. And so I sent those to them and they had a lot of questions about how all that stuff really works, which was really great because a lot of people don't even know how to put the concept of goats kids and milk together in the same sentence. But these kids were like, well, what's your average number of deaths per year? And what happens to the placenta? Over 80 farmers around the state participate in the farmer correspondence program each year, trading letters with around 100 classrooms. What was today like? It was neat to see what the process of making the caramel is and seeing all the goats and how much milk they produce in the creamery. Favorite part of the trip? Um, I really liked visiting the caramel room to see how the caramel is made, because I really love caramel. And they pour it into that, do you see that sort of big silver box? The letter exchange instills a new understanding for these students about what everyday life is like for their farming neighbors. It's great. I mean, it, it really, I mean, I can just see just from today how excited they are. And, you know, I just asked them now, you know, how many of you see yourselves as when you get older doing some sort of a small scale farming like this to make a living? And, you know, over half of them had their hands up, which is which is good to know. I mean, not that it's going to come true, but at least it's that you're putting that notion in their head that there's other things that they can do with their life that does involve working on the land. Using pen and paper to bring together the farmers of today and the students who might just be the farmers of tomorrow and strengthening communities at the same time.
Okay, so we're just going to walk along that thing and back. and then we're gonna The Farmer Correspondence groups. Program is building relationships that are bound to grow. In Brookfield, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. For more information on NOFA Vermont's Farmer Correspondence Program, check the website on your screen and click on the link for programs. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.